recording. All right. And I'm just waiting for the cues so we can have. The... We have one minute to go. I always like to start on time because if people are late, it's not nice to start before. I think we have one minute to go and then we'll start. I'll present the speakers, etc. But I think, yeah, everyone is here. All the speakers are here. There's uh, several other people who said, I'm I'm surprised Subara is not here. She said she would be here. And Gordon, where's Gordon? Oh, he was grading something. Well, he said that he was grading stuff. No, but he told me he would be in. So he'll probably come in in a few. Oh, probably he'll jump just immediately. Um, some other thing. Victoria, Cheno, hola. She's here. Yeah, she's here. Yeah, but I just want to check that that, that we were going to be, be going to be able to see her. We just saw her, and then she just saw her. Oh, okay, perfect. You saw her. That's good. Yeah, we saw her. Saw her. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, Victoria, are you there? Can we start? It's two p.m. Victoria, are you there? It's nine a.m. here. Hola, Victoria. Okay, Hola. So, se ve muy bien. Okay, Hola. so it's okay. eight a.m. for Victoria, right? Okay, no. entonces and, and just to give you credit, Michelle, it's seven a.m. for you, right? No, it's six a.m. Oh, it's six a.m. That's right. I'm on the East Coast, right? Yeah, because we've unfortunately Sorry. changed to two p.m. so <laughs> that Michelle does not get up, have to get up at three. Now he only has to get up at four. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, but he likes to bike and he's already, you know, ready for teaching some extremely okay. early classes. Okay, okay so let, let me give you the cue. So we're going live in just a second. I think you're on. Good luck. Enjoy. You're on? Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Ricardo. So good morning, good afternoon, or good night, depending on where you are. <laughs> My name is Clara Saraiva, and I'm from the University of Lisbon, but I'm also a member of the organizing committee of WCAA, the World Council of Anthropological Associations. And we've been organizing this webinar since April 2020, when the pandemic started, and we carried them on. Uh, the first year was once every month. Now we do it more or less every two months, and we... Uh, try to organize webinars focused on themes and issues that concern not only the anthropological community, but the world in general. We also try to always bring colleagues from different parts of the world that are in some ways uh, specialists of the different topics that we uh, uh, select for each webinar. So first of all, as I was saying, this is a way WCA and WOW, WOW is the World, um, so, um, sorry, <laughs> World Anthropological Union, which is now a joint um, association uh, made up by WCA, the World Council of Anthropological Associations, and IUAES, the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. So, um, as I said, uh, we have participants from all over the world. And before we start, I want to once again thank our colleagues, not only my colleagues in the organizing committee who always help with this, but also uh, Subhadra uh, from my UAS, who's also now uh, with me organizing these webinars. And of course, uh, my colleagues from the University of Mexico, Ricardo Faguaga, who takes care of all the IT and Michelle Bouchard from the University of Western of um, British Columbia, who also takes care of the IT and of, of hosting this uh, technological, hosting this, this webinar. So as Ricardo said, this is being recorded. It will be later on placed in our website and it's also being transmitted live and um, through Facebook. So, this webinar today uh, is actually the second part of two webinars that we organized focused on uh, an issue that is unfortunately very much uh, present in today's world, which is the issue of human rights, or to even put it better, the lack of respect for human rights. And um, so 
the first one was more focused on Brazil and um, on South America because of the, I, I you probably all heard of it, but uh, in the early summer, early European summer, there was the murder of some um, activists in Brazil. And of course, at the time also, the, the government in Brazil was not really uh, willing to advertise or to acknowledge the the misrespect and the problems with with uh, human rights and especially the rights of indigenous people. So we had that webinar uh, two months ago, uh, basically with a lot of colleagues from Brazil or connected with the Brazilian issues for indigenous people. This time, the second webinar on human rights, I tried to get um, colleagues that are not so focused in Latin America, but elsewhere in the world, so that we get different views from different parts of the globe on the same issue. In the last webinar, besides uh, Latin America, I must say, we also had Annapurna uh, who, Padne, who, was a, a, who is a specialist on the on indigenous rights in, in India. So we had also, we had sort of the two sides of the world, Latin America and uh, in Asia. So now today, um, I want to thank very much to all the colleagues who can partake in this, uh, in this webinar. As I said before, the webinar is always something very informal where each one speaks for five minutes and we do a first round, then we go into a second round and then we open it up to, uh, questions from the public that can come through the chat, or we can even have the people speak uh, directly in the in Zoom if they wish. So normally I ask people who do this in the chat or in person to present themselves, say where they're from, which institution, etc. So our confirmed participants for today are Shingirai Niakabau from the University of Western Cape, Victoria Cheno, Maria Victoria Cheno, from Ciesas in Mexico, Yasmin Habib from the University of Waterloo in Canada, Richard Wilson, University of Connecticut, USA, of course, and Magnus Fiskeyu, I do not know if I'm saying this right, Cornell University. And I will very briefly present our speakers and then I will give them the floor. So Shingirai Niakabau recently completed his PhD in anthropology at the University of Western Cape. His research and publications focus on transnational migration, migrant rights, and contestations of citizenship in Southern Africa. Maria Victoria Cheno is a professor and researcher at Mexico Center for Research and Advanced Studies in Social Anthropology, CIESAS, and her research field is legal anthropology, in particular issues of legal pluralism, gender and law, justice and interlegality in indigenous regions. She's also a member of the executive committee of IUAES. Yasmin Habib is founding director of the Global Engagement Seminar Program and associate professor in the Global Governance Program. Her work focuses on the politics of empire and the practices of decolonization with interest in the experiences of war affected refugees now living in Israel, Palestine, Canada, and the United States. Indigenous Practices and religion, in Relations of Auton Autonomy in Northern America, and the Architecture of Consent for Contemporary State Violence. She is past editor-in-chief of Anthropologica, the flagship journal of the Canadian Anthropology, and in 2022, she was awarded the Weaver Tremblay Award in Canadian Applied Anthropology. Richard Wilson is a professor of anthropology and law and associate dean of the University of Connecticut School of Law. He is currently conducting an anthropological study of online hate speech and hate crimes in Latin America and the United States. Last but not least, Magnus Fiskeyu, Cornell University. He's originally from Sweden and he worked in Sweden for foreign service in China and Japan and was director of the Museum of Far Eastern Antiquities in Stockholm. His research has focused on ethnic minority issues in Asia human rights and forced confessions in China, and especially the ongoing genocides in Burma and in China. So I want to once again, in my name and in the name of WCA and WOW, thank everyone for their participation. This, as I said, will be afterwards available later on in our WOW website so that 
if people cannot attend now, they can always go back to it and listen to us all. So I did not send you specific questions because I, from interacting with you through mails and with your bio notes, et cetera, I know that you all work on different areas of the globe, but all with this focus on the defense of human rights. And so basically um, I would just, you know, do a first round with five minutes each where you can, of course, freely talk about your work, but also uh, your opinions or whatever you want to tell us um, about the human rights and anthropology. How does, how, how does anthropology look at human rights and how can anthropology actually, anthropology and anthropologists help in defending um, people's human rights? And as always, I will start, I will do this from the east to the west. Of course, many of you are in the same time zone, so I kind of had the ladies first, but we will start with our colleague from South Africa. Uh, Shingirai, are you there? Could you start, please? Uh, I'll give you the, the five minutes you're entitled to. Thank you very much. Um... I will focus on uh, in uh, on my work in in South Africa in particular, and um, I'd say that in 2010, South Africa regularized um, undocumented Zimbabwean migrants. Uh, it issued them permits which are similar to um, the temporary protected status in the United States. But uh, it decided to terminate those permits um, on 31 December 2021. And the migrants were given um, until June next year to leave South Africa. So my work in this one is interested in um, the normative conception of human rights by the former recipients of uh, temporary immigration permits that were issued by South Africa on how they conceptualize uh, their deservedness uh, of the permits not being uh, terminated and um, how, they how they mobilize conceptions of kinship, uh, rootedness, and the histories uh, of their migration to make a claim uh, to the South African state uh, so that they may be able to continue living in South Africa. So in this one, um, my, my main issue is that uh, anthropologists should uh, approach human rights based on the ways in which the people conceptualize um, their understanding of human rights rather than just focusing on the legal categories um, of human rights that are based on international human rights law. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Shingerai. So we'll go on to our next um, participant, Maria Vittoria Chenot, please. Oh, you have to unmute yourself. Escuchan? Sí, 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 está bien. Okay. I am going to talk about two topics that affect the human rights in Mexico, in my consideration. One is the process of water privatization in the country. This process began in 1992 with the proclamation of the National Waters Law which recognizes the right of private companies to have access to water systems. Not only were concessions granted to companies in many parts of the country, but also new mixed water exploitation enterprises with private and state capital began to emerge promoted by the World Bank. This uh, privatization became clear on 2018 when the president of Mexico signed 10 decrees lifting the existing prohibition of water use on 295 basins throughout the country. 
One of the aspects of this new regulation is that creates the conditions for the granting of concessions to private companies, something that before was not possible. Concessions for the use of water from these basins for mining and oil extraction projects can run for as long as 50 years and they will especially affect the population of the Atlantic coastal plain. Uh, these concessions give priority rights to private individuals or companies over the communities settled in the neighborhood of river, rivers and water bodies. This constitutes a problem for, for, the, for the human rights of these communities. Specialists have argued that although the decrees do not automatically privatize water, the platform has been established for privatization and the rights of the nearby indigenous communities could be ignored. The state intends to benefit private national and transnational capital through the promotion of mega projects like mining, and oil and gas exploration and extraction. And this limit the access to water of the inhabitants in clear infringement of the right to water guaranteed in the constitution, in the Mexican constitution, article four. The argument that these neoliberal policies seek to advance national development leads to consider these projects as matter of social interest and public benefit that must have priority over any other productive activity such as agriculture. The rightful owners of a piece of land may require if in case that private or state enterprises require to develop a mega project the, the owners of the land are bound by law to give the land in a form of rent or lease. Also, the water resources that are considered useful for these extractive projects may be expropriated on the ground of public interest. And the owners of the land in which these resources are found cannot oppose to it. Concessions and assignations have indeed come to legalize the, expoli the expoliation of indigenous territories and indigenous communities are hardly ever informed, let alone consulted as established in the Indigenous and Tribal Peoples Convention 169. These neoliberal policies are in, con in contrast with the way indigenous communities conceive the water and manage its use. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. So now we'll go on to, to our next uh, speaker, Yasmin Habib, please. Hi, Clara. So I came into this expecting you to ask me some questions. So I have not actually prepared any notes. Um, I will speak. I guess I, what I'll do from top of mind is uh, right now are several issues that I'm working on and uh, with communities about. So one of the uh, critical issues that we're working with, and this is across Canada likely, um, are working with people who are objecting to the Canadian government's um, process of essentially denying Indigenous peoples their rights and claims to property, their land, uh, over resources. So that's one issue that um, animates my life. Uh, uh, the other things that I'm most attentive to and that I'm working most closely on are um, working with Israelis, primarily Israeli activists, uh, working on human rights and human justice uh, and human rights and human justice organizations on uh, essentially uh, with an attention to Palestinian rights. So this has been, a I, I'm gonna say lifelong because it feels like a lifelong endeavor. Um, this is something that has always been of interest to me. It partly, it, it, it 
partly comes out of my own experience. So my own uh, family is both Palestinian and Jewish, Israeli, and uh, people with whom I'm most attached are also involved in these organizations, mostly informally, uh, in the past more formally. Uh, the current government, uh, if anyone is paying any attention to what's happening um, in Israel, the new, uh, the new Israeli government has now veered almost to the extreme right uh, uh, by some, some, some have called it a fascist government. Um, others are saying it's an extreme right government. Some are calling it an illiberal uh, government. There's the range of all of these issues, but it, it is very much on uh, top of mind. The question now will be whether or not this government will introduce the annexation of the uh, rest of the territories of the West Bank, which are currently militarily occupied by the Israelis. There are areas that are considered autonomous, and we can talk about that um, with respect to what uh, autonomy actually means uh, for Palestinians' everyday lives. But those are some of the issues that are currently animating my life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't ask you specific questions because, like I said, I you know we always tend to have this in a very very informal way and and allow all the colleagues, all the participants to actually bring on bring about their their own you know issues, questions, and and this normally becomes a lively debate. Um, so it's very informal and really based on a on the debate type of thing more than presentations. So that that was just great. Thank you very much, Yasmin. So now we'll move on to our two colleagues from uh, the US. Uh, so Richard Wilson, University of Connecticut, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's very nice to see old friends and to meet new ones. Um, I'm Richard Wilson. I'm an anthropologist of human rights for some time. Uh, what I've been interested in since about 2014 is, is a, a few phenomena which have coalesced simultaneously. First of all, uh, the rise of populist and authoritarian regimes around the world, um, the rise of digital platforms as a, a core form of, of, of discourse around the world, and the use by states of those platforms to engage in information operations. The Oxford Computational Project estimates that 80 countries around the world uh, have propaganda, uh, covert propaganda and surveillance campaigns online. Um, including the United States, South Korea, Britain, as well as a variety of other countries. And, and, and with this, there's been, uh, this will be no news to those of you uh, working on these issues, a global assault on human rights, uh, an assault on human rights activists around the world, uh, the retrenchment of uh, human rights organizations, and um, uh, a, a, a situation where anti-corruption, this is more broadly part of an attack on civil society, uh, civil society organizations, journalists, and others. And what I've been interested in uh, for about the last uh, three or four years are state-sponsored attacks on human rights activists. Um, there has been some research uh, by a variety of social scientists on, uh, on online attacks. And they tended to focus on attacks on, on minority groups. Uh, so uh, Muslims in Germany, um, uh, African-Americans in the United States, uh, religious and ethnic minorities, and the degree to which online attacks uh, lead to offline harms. And there've been economists who've identified correlations between uh, online speech and offline harms. And I think that debate has more or less been settled. The consensus very broadly in the social sciences now, is that uh, online speech does correlate, although it's not causal to, uh, we haven't identified that yet, but correlates with offline harms. Uh, now, I think there's a space here for anthropologists to say something new and original. First of all, uh, we need to look both at online speech as well as uh, offline harms. And uh, to do the research offline, uh, the qualitative and ethnographic research that complements the online study. Uh, I, I would argue that we need to be quantitative as well as qualitative. So the quantitative analyses of online speech can be very useful. And I've tried to partner with, because uh, I'm not myself uh, a quantitative researcher, I've tried to partner with those uh, to put together those research projects. Uh, I published a piece just last month I'll, I'll put this in the chat. 
um, a piece that just came out in Human Rights Quarterly last month, where I examined the effects on human rights activists in Guatemala and Colombia of state-sponsored um, uh, attacks on them. And I, I try and characterize the types of online speech. So there are threats, there's dehumanization, there's accusations that human rights activists are criminals, they're Marxists, they're corrupt, um, and, uh, and, and there's uh, uh, a whole range of, of discourse, which I've tried to break down. Um, I also look at the effects. I interviewed uh, 60 uh, human rights activists in Colombia and Guatemala. Um, I spent time in Guatemala. I was on my way to Colombia when the pandemic hit, so I couldn't go, but I did the, 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 did the online interviews. And what I found is that the lethal harms, uh, the actual uh, human rights activists being killed is, is only the tip of the iceberg of the effects on human rights activists. So in Colombia every year, the figures around 100 to 120 human rights activists are, are killed. Um, in Guatemala, it's around 10 to 15. And uh, these are among the highest uh, in the top 10, the highest in, in the world. Uh, but I found a, a number of non-lethal effects, and I'll just finish up here. Um, I found that many human rights activists, um, uh, they quit their work, they flee the country, they apply for asylum in the United States, like Thelma Aldana and Clara Paz y Paz and Juan Sandoval, all of them uh, attorneys, prosecutors in Guatemala. Um, they, uh, they, they experience fear, intimidation, they change the way they work, uh, they take protective measures uh, regarding their families. And I think that anthropologists can really draw out those um, those kind of uh, emotional and health harms that are not easily captured in the official data, uh, which is being studied by economists and sociologists and others. So I think there's a role there for anthropologists to to um, to really fill out in a in a complementary and qualitative way the uh, the understanding that we have of the harms of online hate speech directed at human rights activists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. So now, last but not least, Magnus, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. I'm so glad to join your group. I wanted to try to show a couple of um, pictures, uh, which you said um, I could. Is that okay? Certainly, certainly. You're more than welcome. Actually, I told you there was no time for real PowerPoints, but I explained you could share a screen yeah. to show us whatever you feel like. Yes, please. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Ricardo? I'm, I'm asking for help because I'm not, or Ricardo and Michel Bouchard, because I'm not the IT host. So I think they have to allow you to share screen. Yeah, now it's working. Wait. Yeah. Okay, now we see. Okay, thank you. So um, I heard uh, part one about uh, genocide, ecocide in uh, Brazil, and uh, I want to bring up uh, something that is uh, similar in China. There's a massive genocide going on against uh, Uyghur people who are about 12 million and related ethnic groups. So it's targeting about 15 million people. One aspect of this that uh, resonates with uh, many anthropologists um, and myself uh, is the confiscation of children. Um, in China now, there's the hundreds of thousands of children that are taken to um, Chinese-only um, schools and orphanages uh, where they are forbidden from speaking their own language and actually beaten if they do. Their parents are all in um, uh, massive detention camps where they are being forced to renounce their ethnic identity uh, and their culture. Um, and um, some of them are being, this is from a leaked file of police ID photos of, of um, victims, um, many of whom are transferred from these uh, re-education camps to uh, so-called to prisons or to uh, forced labor. Uh, many are forced sterilized along the way. Uh, it's a campaign 
uh, comparable to the um, uh, sterilization of um, ethnic women in uh, Fujimori's um, Peru. Uh, there's uh, widespread um, targeting of um, cultural leaders. So for example, the singer uh, in this music video from 2015, just before the genocide was launched in 2017, he's uh, singing uh, a song about children being proud of their culture and uh, able and willing to be uh, learning Chinese, English, uh, but still be proud of their Uyghur culture. Uh, this is uh, his crime. And uh, he's now been uh, taken away. We don't know if he's still uh, alive. Uh, another um, example of this kind of uh, decapitation of the cultural elite of the Uyghur people is uh, Rahila Dawood, this um, anthropologist in the middle here with um, some of her informants. She's very well known in anthropological circles uh, working in this part of um, Central Asia, controlled by, by China. She was taken as she was on her way to a conference in 2017, and um, uh, she has been disappeared since. We, we don't know uh, why or if she is still alive. Uh, the American Anthropological Association has issued uh, calls for her release, um, uh, but um, we don't know what her fate um, is. Uh, the only explanation for her um, disappearance is that uh, she too stands for the pride uh, of Uyghur culture, not necessarily in the separatist mode, wanting to have a separate state or anything like that, uh, but to, to defend uh, their own culture. And this is now no longer uh, allowed. And there, there's on the one hand, this mass detention of cultural leaders, uh, which is, of course, as you can imagine, uh, instilling fear in the entire population of 15 million people because they can see how um, their culture is being um, destroyed. This is happening at the same time as, as I mentioned, massive numbers of ordinary people who are innocent are taken away to these camps. And also at the same time, there's the physical destruction of cultural monuments, uh, religious holy places, pilgrimage sites, anything that serves as a foundation of Uyghur culture is being bulldozed and destroyed. Now, this has been taken up in um, since 2018 in the United Nations, first in the Committee Against Racial Discrimination, which issued a biting report, but then the Chinese government, which is conducting all of these atrocities, they have been able to mobilize global opinion uh, in their favor, to the point that uh, two months ago, they were able to um, win a vote in the Human Rights Council in um, the United Nations in Geneva to prohibit a further discussion of all of this. So the United Nations Human Rights Council has formally uh, prohibited further discussion. It's not on the agenda of the UN Human Rights Council. They achieved this by the help of countries like, uh, activist countries like uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Russia and others who also despise human rights and therefore want to support uh, what the Chinese government is doing. But unfortunately, they also get the support of many countries who are afraid of China all across the world and therefore abstain and help this to go through. Now I'm looking forward, um, looking ahead, I will continue to um, work on this. I want to collaborate with um, colleagues that look at the historical phenomenon of Indian schools uh, and uh, the confiscation and um, conver ethnic conversion of children as part of, as one method of genocide, because this is what's happening in, in China to these hundreds of thousands of children that are being um, held. Um, we have information from the inside about how this works. Within less than two years, because of the terror inflicted on these children, they uh, do 
uh, forget uh, their own language and, and culture. Siblings are separated and they do all sorts of things to, to frighten the children into this. To become Chinese, which is the purpose of this. It is a genocide where many people are dying, but the killing is not the main thing. It is the forced assimilation. Um, I'll stop here. I also put a reference in the chat where you can read more about um, what's happening. Thank you. Stop share. Okay, Magnus, thank you very much for this really <laughs> incredible and really terrifying uh, scenario. Well, uh, unfortunately, as we all know, the violation of human rights is spread throughout the world. And like I said, in our first webinar on human rights, we, we had participants focusing more on Latin America, Brazil, and not only, and India. And today we fortunately have colleagues working in other different parts of the world where sadly the violation of human rights is a very, very uh, horrible a reality. Um, as you now that you've heard all our five participants, one talking about South Africa, the other one about Mexico, Victoria, the first one Shingai, Shingirai then Victoria about Mexico, then Yasmin about uh, Israel and Palestine, Richard Wilson on, well, several issues related to populism and digital platforms and what anthropologists can do. And then uh, finally, Magnus on this uh, genocide and fourth assimilation of, of Chinese children and not only children. And you're probably wondering why is uh, Iran not here today? Well, I did try, but as I said, um, since because of what's going on nowadays in, in Iran, well, so unfortunately it has been going on for decades, of course, but now it's so blunt and so and so visible throughout the media. But uh, the, the colleagues in Iran said they could not speak out because of you know obvious problems they would have. But I've I've been um, getting in touch with with women Iranian women in in the diaspora, and they will be present in our upcoming webinar for the beginning of 2023, probably either late January or very early February. One of them will be uh, Ziba Mir Husseini, who's actually at the SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, and and she will be talking. She's a of course, a legal uh, anthropologist and an activist for uh, Middle Eastern human rights. So we will have that part on on in the beginning of 2023. It's too bad we cannot have someone here today, but we will with a different subject matter, but we will go on discussing these issues of human rights violation and very specifically women rights uh, violation in in the world. So um, for now, we've had all these five participants giving us this set scenarios. And now, uh, since many of you have not only presented situations that are very concrete, but have also raised some questions, I will go to the second round. So I'll give you each one, um, again, uh, five minutes tops. Of course, you can, I mean, if it's one or two minutes beyond, it's not a big, it's not a problem. And um, and after you, we go on the second time. And I think this this is useful since you've all heard each other. So now you you're probably thinking of, of of questions and issues that interrelate um, and that are that connect this such situations all over the world. So I'll give the floor to each one of you, and then after that second round, we will go on to the open questions by the public and also the questions that have been. Uh, written in the chat, uh, questions, comments, etc. So we will go again to our colleague from South Africa, Shingirai. Are you there? Yes, yeah. um, I'm here. All right. Please. So um, I, I think I would like to comment more on what um, Wilson uh, presented, which is on uh, propaganda surveillance and assault on uh, human rights uh, activists. I actually didn't speak about it, but um, I, I come from a country where it is a daily occurrence and the, 
we have even reached a state whereby uh, we no longer research about it. Um, I'm from Zimbabwe and um, it's not just uh, propaganda surveillance, but um, real physical violence, abduction and uh, arbitrary imprisonment. Um, what else? Uh, the, 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 the civil society activists are dismissed as uh, puppets of, of Western governments. And the moment that they are labeled as uh, puppets uh, of Western governments, it also justifies any form of violence uh, that the state unleashes against them. And um, I think in the future, we may find some way where we can collaborate. I would say that uh, I was really impressed by that because uh, uh, it spoke to, it spoke near the experience of my own country. So um, I would say that maybe the other thing, um, which maybe I may like to get insight from him is um, how, how do anthropologists differ in their study of um, political violence from political scientists? Um, what new approaches and new insights do we bring in? Uh, so that we don't re uh, repeat what political scientists uh, are, are doing. Um, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shingirai. So I'll now uh, go on to Maria Victoria. Yes, thank you. Well, I, I want to, to talk a little about women gender and legal pluralism. In Mexico, the articulation of the state and indigenous laws is manifested in different ways, depending on the different contexts, its historical, social, and cultural contexts. Authorities are elected by the members of the community and may or may not be in agreement with those that operate within the framework of each state's political organization. Likewise, justice is applied in accordance with a set of particular penalties among indigenous groups. Due to the specificities of indigenous law, which depend on the characteristics of each group, it is not possible to speak of a system of indigenous law characterized by homogeneity and uniformity, and instead it takes a specific form in each context. The term interlegal processes used in different instances of legal pluralism is used to emphasize the condition of change and historicity, dynamism and flexibility of legal pluralism. Likewise, I apply the term indigenous law to the normative systems and practices in indigenous regions that regulate the rights and responsibility of family members, marriage transactions, and the transmission of inheritances, as well as the exercise of authority and resolution of conflicts. In these interlegal processes, it is necessar necessary to analyze the position of indigenous women who turn to the justice system of the state. The conflicts that reach state justice institutions are strongly permeated by the gender relations established in rural areas. Such is the case of the marital disagreements, child support, domestic violence, and inheritance, among other aspects. These situations allow us to appreciate the ideologies, values, lifestyles, and forms of social organization of those who choose to turn to institutions of the state when seeking a solution, a negotiation, or a stop to interpersonal tensions that arise from society's daily life. 
The way social groups conceive gender relations at different times and in different sociocultural contexts demonstrates the historical, situational, and socially constructed character of gender. It is necessary to take into account that there exist gender conceptions and ideologies of a patriarchal nature in indigenous communities that imply instances of asymmetry of the women within family and community life. In relation to the law of the state, we must take into consideration that on the one hand, domination is exercised through penalization and punishment, coercion and the imposition of legal norms, concepts and categories, thus maintaining gender ideologies for the subordination of women and the violation of human rights in judicial processes. On the other hand, the law of the state may also help women to resist certain forms of domination. It may become a space for women to reestablish their positions and to negotiate social relations receiving guarantees or at least the symbolic protection of the state in such instances as marital conflict. In this way, state law and justice might become a space for indigenous women to claim their rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. So I'll now give the floor to Yasmin Habib. I cannot see her. Are you gone? Jasmine? She was having some internet problems. She'll be back, I think. Oh, she was having internet problems. Oh. Yeah. Did you see the chat? So yeah, yeah, the chat. But I thought I thought that was in the beginning and she had overcome those. Um I'm not sure. So go to somebody else and when she yeah, comes to that, yeah. Okay, I will. So I will pass on to to Richard. Since sure, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shingi. I would be very interested in talking to you more about what's going on in South Africa. I worked there in the 90s, so, but I'm out of date. Um, what you're saying resonates very much with my research in Latin America. Um, I think anthropology, at least since the early 20th century in Franz Boas, is essentially an anti-racist discipline. It's a discipline that opposes uh, xenophobia and nationalism. And we've seen a tremendous rise of that all around the world, where uh, any opposition to uh, particularly right-wing governments, uh, neoliberal governments, are called um, uh, agents of foreign powers. In Latin America, human rights activists are regularly called, you know, in the pay of Soros. Um, you, you see online that there are photoshopped uh, pictures of of them with uh, with foreigners, you know, in the pay of foreigners, taking money from foreigners. These are um, memes that are presented, um, uh, you know, to to smear and to denigrate uh, the work of human rights activists. And you know, I, I interviewed human rights activists who said, "Look, ten years ago, we had tremendous authority. People looked to us to tell the truth about what was really happening." But now people just see us as, you know, um, uh, foreign agents working for George Soros, and they managed to desprestigiar. They managed to pull us down and uh, and and smear our reputation uh, through through online um, means. Um, what can we do that's different from political scientists? Well, I think a lot actually, because political scientists are very much seduced by quantification. And so they are really, um, and it is possible online by pulling, you know, you can you can go on to the program R and pull 20,000 tweets every 10 minutes. Um, and you can analyze literally hundreds of thousands and millions of posts uh, using various um, analytical programs. And so the political scientists who do this, um, you know, there are a couple who worked on the Alternative for Deutschland in Germany, their Facebook site, and they analyzed 700,000 posts 
and they matched them to correlate them to attacks on uh, Syrian refugees in 2017 and 18. But interestingly, in their analysis, they coded according to hate speech or not hate speech. So they used a simple binary in their quantitative analysis. Now, I think anthropologists want to go deeper than that. Um, we want to be more contextual. We want to get into the richness of the language and the culture and the history. And so in our uh, analysis that I put in the chat, um, we didn't just use this binary of hate speech, not hate speech. We, we looked at actually 12 categories of hate speech that are directed against human rights activists. So we tried to adopt a much more culturally informed view and we, we got this from the human rights activists themselves because we asked them and we interviewed them and we spent time with them. And so we tried to really understand uh, the, the, the cultural resonance of the kind of speech that was occurring online. I'll just give you one example. In, 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 in Guatemala, if you say um, uh, you want to directly threaten someone, you say, the white van is coming for you. The white van was a... Um, was a death squad vehicle in the 1980s. And so the white van, La Pano Blanca, it doesn't mean anything in Mexico, it doesn't mean anything in El Salvador. It only means something in Guatemala. In Colombia, they say, manda la moto, vamos a mandar la moto, means we're sending the motorcycle because many assassins arrive on a motorcycle. It doesn't mean anything in Mexico or in Guatemala or in you know other countries around it. it. Only means something specific in Colombia. So I think that's the kind of cultural specificity and understanding that anthropologists can bring to this topic that political scientists don't often get. Thank you very much, Richard. I really loved your input on this, on the culture specificities that anthropologists can really reach and that political scientists normally do not tend to because they're not, they do not have the same approach that we have as a discipline. I think that's one of the, the big, uh, not only a goal and objective, but also uh, something that anthropology has that makes it different and worthwhile, I think. Well, Okay, so let's move on to the next speaker. Uh, I think Yasmin is not yet back. I hope she does come back, but I don't see her yet. So I will move on to Magnus and then we'll ho hopefully, um, hopefully our colleague Yasmin will, will come back again online. So Magnus, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, we hear you uh, very well. Thank you. Yeah, I was also... Um, of course, in agreement with um, a focus on um, uh, authoritarianism, uh, China is at the top of the list in the world. And I think their example really um, stands out for the kind of total control of information domestically and now also in part internationally that they have achieved, that Chinese government is able to put um, hundreds of millions of dollars and uh, thousands of people um, into uh, policing uh, what used to be a civil space and also to flood it with um, counter arguments in case there's anything that uh, pops up. And of course, one consequence of this in the context of the Uyghur genocide as I'm talking about is that the majority of Chinese people don't know about it. Uh, they are uh, ignorant and this is because it's systematically suppressed uh, and uh, they're fed other narratives that blame the ethnic uh, minorities and describe them as as deserving of this treatment which the nature of which is is withheld so people don't know about this <clears throat> and this kind of indicates that um information itself becomes the number one battlefield uh, on this score because um, the reason you know China, Saudi Arabia, Russia, they can get away with this in the UN is because people around the world are not paying attention. So it, it really becomes uh, a, a battlefield uh, number one. I want to mention in uh, just the last few weeks, there's been an extraordinary new development. So because of 
um, very harsh COVID lockdowns in China. Um, Chinese people, for this reason, snapped. And it just happened accidentally that part of the reason people snapped was uh, an apartment uh, building fire in Urumqi, one of the Uyghur cities, where lots of Uyghurs were burnt uh, alive in their apartments, uh, be mostly women and children, because the men were in the concentration camps. Uh, but this uh, became a wake-up call and it sparked uh, expressions of solidarity. So when there were these street protests in China with majority Han Chinese, ethnic minority Han Chinese, they actually picked up and sometimes expressed solidarity with uh, the Uyghurs. It's quite extraordinary that despite these tremendous efforts of the Chinese state to prevent people from knowing anything about it, there are still people who know about it and that, Give some source of hope. There are people who know how to jump the great firewall of censorship blocking and, and so on. So again, I, I feel that um, in here, all, all, all sorts of things that anthropologists also can study better than um, political scientists or others, in, especially in terms of how do people become uh, persuaded? Uh, uh, when is there space for doubt and skepticism and uh, and the pluralism um and and uh, how can that be promoted i think those become very big questions finally i also want to mention on um, women of course in genocide women are especially targeted because they they um, represent the future in a sense and now they're being prevented from giving birth to the next generation, because in the next generation, there will not be an Uyghur people anymore. So there's a devastating array of, of measures targeting women. And I co-wrote um, an article with an Uyghur activist, a woman activist about this, and I'll put that uh, in the chat. Thanks. All right, Magus, thank you so much once again. So let's see if our colleague Yasmin Habib has returned. Oh, she hasn't. Clara, she yeah. hasn't. I'm going to send her um, some email and ask her if if she wants to uh, just email back some questions or comments. I will. Yeah, well, I... well, what perhaps we could try if her, net, her if her internet's not working. An hypothesis would be to do it like if you call her through WhatsApp and then we can listen to her. I've done that. Let me, let me try I've, something. But in the I, meantime, I have done that other times when the internet fails. We can try. I don't know. I understand. Let me try something. Okay. Something. So while while Virginia tries to help us on this, and Habib comes back. So let's just see. We do have many many interesting issues here unfortunately <laughs> unfortunately in the sense that yes there is such a wide violation of human rights in the world so we had Shingari telling us about migrants in South America but also uh, sorry sorry in South Africa but also about the case of Zimbabwe and violation of human rights and then uh, Maria Victoria Cheno talking about uh, water rights in Mexico and then on the violation of human rights concerning women and the position of women's society. Then Jas Yasmin uh, Habib told us a, a bit about the terrible situation, as we know, between Israel and Palestine. And, and of course, there's always the issue, as she mentioned, of what is Israel right now, a fascist government, a neoliberal government, according to some, of an extreme right government. And of course, these issues of politics certainly try tie in with all the issues that have been uh, discussed here by all the participants and that we will go on discussing now in a more open um, scenario where everybody can bring their questions and, and participate. And then we had Richard Wilson uh, telling us, well, um, expanding on the rise of populism, digital platforms, and also in his second round, uh, I think very interesting um, issues of the specificity of anthropology in in trying to help on on this issue of the violation of human rights and what do we do or what we can do as an anti uh xenophobia discipline 
compared to other disciplines as political sciences and other disciplines who rely more on quantitative data. And then finally, we had Magnus, uh, of course, focusing on the, on the very blunt uh, um, issue and example of the Uyghur children and people in general, and, and uh, not only the genocide, but also the forced assimilation that this people are being brought into and of course uh, of course unfortunately it's not a unique case and as Subhatra wrote in the chats there are violations like this in India which is not supposed to be a dictatorship as in in China at least it's not supposed to be so Subhatra wrote in the chat yes what about what happens in countries that are supposedly more democratic supposedly of course many things go on behind the scenes and we uh often do not come to public. But actually, I think that one, I don't know if you all agree with me, but one of the things that happens now it, nowadays is that, yes, uh, things have changed from 50 years ago. So communication is definitely much more open. And, and although uh, many anti-democratic um, and dictator, dictatorial uh, regimes try to hide as most as they can their atrocities, somehow they come out to the public and they come out to, to the rest of the world. And, and that's how, uh, well, AAA and also WCA, we've written many letters in the past few years trying to help to get fellow colleagues, anthropologists out of prisons, for instance, in, in Iran, but not only, <laughs> that's not the only case. So yes, it, it is indefinitely, like Richard was saying, a world where digital platforms can do very good and can also do very bad. But okay, so let's see here. In in um, in the chat, we have several comments and and questions. For instance, Isaac was telling us about the the, the sad news in the in the in the British Channel about the tragedies with migrants trying to cross the channel. But also, then we had, of course, um, Virginia with a question about human rights. Uh, are there more human rights violations now than in the past? Or are these examples of human rights violation that you have addressed just more of the same as in the past? Has it increased or not? And also uh, Gordon asked, especially uh, addressed to Magnus, but I think not only, he says, I myself can talk about the Uyghur issue in my Hong Kong classes, but what would you advise mainland Chinese anthropologists to do, some of whom fully agree with you? Uh, should they try to speak informally with students or just shut up for danger of being jailed? And um, and also in other range of societies are authoritarian, authoritarian societies like China, of course, more likely to cause human violations than democratic societies like Israel, so to say. Or is this a part of, or is this in part self-serving Western myth? So, um, uh, and then there were some other questions from Guven uh, saying, well, uh, telling Richard that the longitudinal dimension is sometimes we something we do very well, we meaning anthropologists. So that was, of course, a, a commentary adding to what Richard was saying about the, the positive aspects of anthropology and what anthropologists can bring into this fight for human rights and the study of human rights. But Clara, let, yeah. let's not do all the questions. No, I was not. I was not going to do all the oh, questions. Okay. I was just Great. trying, trying to get some so that we get some um, dialogue and some debate um, being addressed here. Right. And I just think that the last one that Given also wrote about the terracotta warriors being built by people who are actually obliged to do it uh, is also very interesting. So I don't know who wants to go now. Uh, there's more comments and questions in the chat that you can all look at. Uh, yeah, uh, somebody was saying that IUES also wrote letters for uh, defending Homa Hotfar, so has WCA. Unfortunately, I think she's still in jail. So who does anyone want to go on any of the participants or anyone else comment on these comments in the chat, or do you want to speak up in the in the Zoom um, alive? Yeah. Please. Oh, thank you. Yes, um, the question about uh, the concrete question about uh, what should people inside of China do? It's of course very difficult. Those people that uh, went into those street protests, just uh, 
in the last few weeks. They are now being hunted down. Uh, their faces are being tracked into the face recognition databases. It's become very, very difficult to, to do anything. On the other hand, I am also noticing that a lot of the protesters are being held for a week and registered and so on and then let go. And uh, that is very different from um, the um, a situation for uh, Uyghurs. Uh, they, they all, in this people of 12 million, they all have uh, family members, friends, and others who have disappeared, and they don't know who they are. Um, many since 2017, uh, families are are split. It's a it's a different situation. So in that sense, even though the Chinese regime can seem draconian, uh, uh, even against the the majority Han Chinese people, I think that they are actually uh, more lenient. And it must have something to do with how the regime is still wary of putting off uh, its own people too much. There are people shouting down with the Communist Party and they don't want to hear that. They want to make it impossible to have anybody even have the idea of shouting something like that because they want to preserve their power. So it suggests to me that there is a certain space in China for uh, dissent and um, I cannot tell them to rise up they have to do that themselves and they have to Chinese anthropologists have to decide for themselves uh, they risk their career their family their lives so nobody can ask them to speak up but um, uh, certainly it is um, it is welcome I also had a short comment to the broader questions about um, democratic countries and um, uh, non-democratic countries. Uh, I think the, share, the, the thing that um, uh, these uh, regimes that uh, commit human rights violations, what they, what they share is rather whether they have democratic features or, or no such features, whether they're all authoritarian. Uh, I, I think it's... Um, actually less important than whether they are um, um, guided by um, uh, neo-nationalist ideology. Uh, this is the case with China. Uh, this is the case with uh, many other countries. I think it is the main danger in India. There's a similar ethno-nationalist uh, intolerance ar arising in India, similar to that uh, in China. And I think actually that is the main uh, danger. Of course, we cherish democracy because it preserves the space uh, of um, uh, having different uh, opinions and uh, freedom of expression uh, as, as, as part of uh, how it is supposed to be set up. But I think we can't underestimate the danger of uh, nationalistic ideology because it causes people to set these things aside, whether it is China, Brazil, India, it seems to me that it's the same story of uh, self-centered um, uh, ideology that's promoted by the authoritarians to help them take over and eventually dismantle uh, whatever democracy might have been left in, in some of those countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Magnus. Virginia has her hand up. Virginia? Sent to you um, on, on uh, email, oh, private chat. Yeah, I have a comment from Jasmine. She emailed me back, okay? So uh, I can't hear you now. Oh, I said she came in for a few seconds and I was gonna well, give her the but floor. She but couldn't, she, dis she couldn't, okay. So. <laughs> and she disappeared again. Yeah, if she here's what she says. I can't seem to stay in the webinar. I'm not sure why. I haven't heard the entire discussion, but with respect to political science, it is a discipline that tends to flatten the world where we bring life to it. And by the way, this is me. Uh, she is uh, actually in a department of political science at the University of Waterloo. There's a long history there. But uh, 
all too many working in the IP context. I think that's intellectual property or intangible property context. Imagine Palestinians out of the political realm. For example, they're not understood or studied as political actors and agents. For now, that's all. All right, Virginia, thank you so much for giving Yasmin some voice because really we can, she doesn't seem yeah. to be able to stay online. So who, who else wants to either go back to their own comments on the chat or, or, or say something else or any of the participants or any of the persons who are listening and are not direct participants? I, I saw a very interesting question or comment uh, also by um by uh, Guven uh and you know when Richard's hand is up did you see that sorry Richard? Richard's hand is up Richard okay just one second Richard it's just uh Guven's question was would it help to revisit and revise UN human rights declaration in the context of our online era of surveillance and second would people outside of China feel more genocide urgency by transposing the destruction by analogy in places closer to home. And, you know, uh, one segment target in the US like the Amish or other Anabaptists or uh, the Roma inside of the UK or LGBTQ plus in France, et cetera, et cetera. I think this is also a very interesting um, question and I'll, uh, I'll give the floor to Richard. Yeah, actually, I was going to respond to Guven's uh, point, number okay. one, about the UN declaration and uh, revisiting that. So at the end of my article, I proposed that the UN draft a new declaration on digital conduct by states, that states must sign it and commit themselves to transparency in their digital practices. They must refrain from surveillance uh, that is not approved by law, uh, that is illegal and uh, must refrain from inciting violence against minority groups and uh, their individual citizens. So uh, that's just a start. Um, but I think there is a need uh, to constrain the use of uh, digital platforms by states and the propaganda and information and surveillance campaigns they're undertaking. So uh, rather than rewrite the UN declaration, I think there could be a new UN declaration, which would be leverage to use against states for their digital practices, uh, but also uh, pressuring social media companies. So um, social media companies have one content moderation policy for the entire world. So there's just a single framework. Now, as anthropologists, of course, we know that to be absurd. So just think of Spanish. Spanish is spoken in so many countries around the world. There's so many different types of Spanish. And yet the um, the, uh, the social media companies use content moderators from Spain. Uh, Spanish content moderators may not understand Salvadoran slang on the streets of Los Angeles mm -hmm. or, and vice versa, of course. So um, uh, I advocate in the article that they need to set up local offices in countries, specifically in countries where they're high risk of violence for human rights activists and others, uh, which have journalists in them, which have policymakers, which of course could have anthropologists, uh, providing them input on the meaning of online speech, and also to, to not have a one-size-fits-all policy, but to uh, particularly think about at-risk countries where there are high levels of violence, uh, which may have temporary measures for, say, a six-month period in which the uh, moderation of speech is, is very intensive in those countries uh, and in other countries where there's not violence. So to have some sort of responsive framework uh, to respond to the different levels of political violence in different countries. But my question to you all is how comfortable are you with, with anthropologists making these kinds of policy uh, uh, proposals? Um, you know, I work in a law school where lawyers are always telling governments what to do and it's accepted. But anthropologists, we've tended to be more uh, restrained, even allergic to having our research feed into to changing policy um, frameworks. So I don't know if that's changed, uh, but I'm I'm open to that discussion. Yeah, I think I really truly think that's a very important discussion. Just like Guven was saying now in the chat, because the fact is that yes, 
political scientists, lawyers are accepted uh, as far as that type of action goes, but not anthropologists. And, and my other problem is, you know, relating to what you were just saying and what Victoria said and what Magda said is the fact that, uh, how can I put this? Uh, democracy kind of kills its own purpose in the sense that, okay, if you have UN councils or other councils that work on a democratic basis, right? And then you have countries that are not democratic and where the violation of human rights is uh, a reality, manipulating other countries to vote in these councils against any type of uh, laws or any type of rules or any type of objection to that um, violation of human rights. How can we do this? I'm, I'm saying this because at the moment, a, a very, well, a, a very good friend of mine, like my family of mine, who's an anthropologist, we, we, we met each other because we were both studying law and anthropology at the same time when we were young. Well, I ended up in the academic career in anthropology. She ended up as a diplomat. So she's now the Portuguese ambassador in the UN in New York. And she tells me, it's impossible. We, you know, we try to make democracy work, but then you have a certain numbers of country who told, who object to certain things and democracy works in a way that you have to accept the majority or you have to accept the veto if that's the rule of the, whichever council. So it's kind of a double bind type of thing where we can't, we don't seem to be able to get around. And if we want to promote democracy, uh, rules uh, of, of everyone having a voice and the majority winning, they beat us because the countries, like you were saying, or somebody was saying, uh, Magnus, I think, you know, the countries who have the power and want to go on violating human rights do manipulate others to vote in that sense. How do we get around this if we, if we don't work together, for instance, with lawyers and politicians? I think this adds to Richard's question to all. Any ideas? <laughs> well, I, I would respond. So you're absolutely right. And I don't want to minimize the obstacles to this uh, at all. At the same time, history gives us some examples of very interesting and unexpected outcomes. So for instance, the International Criminal Court began as a petition of Trinidad and Tobago to the UN because their country was overrun with narco traffickers and they sought to create an international court that could address um, that issue, which eventually it didn't, but it set up, eventually led to the setting up of the ICC. Similarly, the genocide of the Rohingya happens and it's the Gambia that brings the denunciation to the International Court of Justice. And so, um, it does require a, a state actor to pick up the issue and put it on the international agenda. And I've just given you two examples where it's the Gambia and Trinidad, which are, you know, it's it's not Germany or France or the, the UK. So I, I think um, things can happen in unexpected ways. But the question to me is this, uh, what's worse? Um, watching the states use these very powerful technologies to oppress their populations and to crush democracy, because I think without human rights, you can't have democracy, or taking the steps which are very difficult to try and restrain state action. It's, they're two very difficult scenarios, I will admit. Right, right. Thank you, Richard. So who else wants to speak up? Uh, Magnus? Well, uh, I don't want to be the pessimist, but uh, I think it um, it's a dangerous time to propose the revision of the Human Rights um, Declaration. Um, I think there, there's uh, uh, justified reasons for that from an anthropological perspective to insert the right to be different that uh, my old teacher, Terry Turner, uh, used to talk about. Uh, but uh, this, at this very moment, the Chinese government and its allies, Saudi Arabia and all the rest, they are mobilizing big time to revise the concept of human rights at the United Nations and replace the universal human rights concept with their own restricted uh, national-focused uh, human rights idea that each country 
uh, governs its own human rights and nobody can, there should not be any mechanisms for uh, the Human Rights Council to review the interior situation in any other country and so on. And they, they're working on this. There's a, a scholar, Andrea Warden. I just um, put uh, a reference to her article on this uh, from two years ago in the chat. And uh, it's it's truly frightening. I think the it may rather be that we have to defend universal human rights while we may still uh, preserve some um, ideas for how it could be improved, how the concept could be improved and the declaration be improved. But uh, the odds are not looking good for human <laughs> rights in the UN right now. Right, yeah, that's right. So, Victoria? Yes, um, I want to <clears throat> I want to talk about uh, the situation of some countries, like in Latin America, that they are supposed to be democratic, and they are not, or they violate human rights in a very intense form. For instance, in Argentina during the the years of the military coup, and how many people disappeared, how many people was um, in jail for years and years. And this was supposed to try to do because of democracy or because human the situation of the country merits, um, needs this kind of violation of human rights. So I think uh, we cannot, um, consider that the violation of human rights happen only in certain countries. It happens everywhere. And in, in case of Latin America, I think it is a very important situation that we must take into consideration. Thank you. Yes, indeed, uh, Victoria, thank you very much. So anyone else that uh, I see so many comments in the chat, if anyone wants to come in and, and, and talk, you're more than welcome. I uh, want uh, something related to what Victoria was talking about. Subhadra, can, can, you, can you speak a little bit louder? Okay, I'll just put on the... Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Thank uh, you. I was just thinking that sometimes one kind of rights may clash with another kind of rights. And uh, especially when you are talking about indigenous people and they are fighting for their rights to cultural identity. But as in India, I have been talking to some of these indigenous women, especially from those which are coming from patriarchal indigenous communities. They say that the men's demand for cultural identity actually violates their own rights because they then suffer a lot of oppression. Uh, like the Indian government gives equal inheritance rights to men, I mean, all irrespective of gender. But amongst the Nagas, it is strictly patrilineal. So the women are completely deprived of their uh, property rights. Uh, and so you see, there can be a contradiction at times between one kind of right and another kind of right of one section or one class of people. I mean, it's just a dilemma. That's what I was trying to bring out. Sorry, I was, I was, I had, I was muted. So yes, that is definitely true. What you're saying, uh, Subhadra. But actually, what what Michelle Bouchard was just saying, uh, saying in the chat also is that if we reformulate human rights and allow states such as Russia to invade neighboring states and carry mm -hmm. out our religious human rights violations, we will face continued deterioration in human rights globally. So indeed, it is often complicated but uh in, in in a global sense we do have to fight for the human rights defense as a whole right absolutely right yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Gordon, I don't know if you had something to add to this. Um, yeah, I have been teaching a class of African asylum seekers for the last 15 years in Hong Kong. And I am shocked that their view of human rights consists of, uh, for example, they despise Hillary Clinton for coming to places like Kenya and saying, Gay, gay people should be allowed uh, a full equal rights. They say, that's none of her business. Why is she disputing our Kenyan human rights to, to decide our own cultural practices that we don't like gay people? Now, I don't want to get into this argument because I'm completely against what they're saying, but there is a problem here of how do we define legitimate and non-legitimate human rights? I'm, I'm unwilling to say to them, you're wrong and I'm right because you disunderstand, you don't understand the fact that gay people are genetically uh, produced this way. No. And, and so you see the whole problem here. And I've also had these arguments, Magnus, again, with some Chinese who speak of Han Chinese, who speak of the need for Uyghur to fit within the existing uh, Chinese society. So this is really difficult. Uh, this is something that's long been dealt with as far back as Melville Herskovitz as to how much cultural relativism fits in with human rights. I'm still confused about this. What can you tell This is the point that I wanted to make. Want to, does anyone want to address this complicated question of yes, relativism? Subhadra, human Subhadra is that the only thing you wanted to say? Subhadra? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to raise this point just as Gordon raised it. I mean, it is an ongoing issue, which has probably not been resolved. Yes. So, um, oh, okay. Richard has to leave. Thank you so much for your participation. But does anyone want to address directly this question of cultural relativism and human rights that that Gordon and also Subhadra uh, rose? Perhaps Michelle. It's complicated. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I would say in a sense, Gordon, it's very often they're tied together. For example, in Russia, they even they may even tighten. I guess uh, they had. I guess uh, for some years ago, 2013, 14, they passed a law against the promotion of LGBT like you said, I guess, uh, I guess to, to children. Now they've tightened it. So and even talking about, I guess, uh, LGBTQ rights in public now puts you, I guess, in the scope, the crosshairs of, of the state. So, so we see often, and this same things that I guess we see it in Hungary, we see it elsewhere, where very often the states that are increasingly authoritarian, undermining human rights, will also use, in a sense, I guess, attacks on, I guess, uh, I get and it's LGBTQ2 plus as a way to get public support. So it's very much kind of, I guess, all, all tied together. Yeah, but, but, and, and I, but yeah, I totally agree with you, Michelle, but I'm going to ask Magnus directly. If I had one of my Kenyan students say, you think that Uyghurs are being persecuted, we Kenyans are being persecuted more because we're being forced to follow a gay agenda. I know that may seem silly to you, but what would you say to them? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's nice to be talking about these um, issues, which are very real. Um, absolutely, as you as you say, uh, I would say that the key thing is tolerance. Um, tolerance is the underlying principle of both human rights and uh, and the democracy. Um, uh, the, the, there should be uh, a space for. Um, people who are different, whether it's ethnic or gender or some other kind of aspect to um, have a right to be different in that way which they choose. And of course, there, there could be uh, exceptions to that and uh, start talking about the Taliban or, or whatnot. There were things that we cannot, cannot uh, 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 accept. But in, if you put it in this way, I think one would be able to say to a Kenyan student that, uh, look, the Uyghurs just would like to be allowed to continue to be Uyghurs, to continue to speak their language, which is, you know, key points about their right to be different. Uh, and uh, it is the same thing with minorities in Kenya, uh, or indeed with the Kenyans in the world or Chinese in the world. The principle should be the same for everyone. That's the way I would try to put it. But they can be something more concrete, like inheritance rights, which I was talking about. Now, you know, 
there can be, I mean, it's not just something very abstract like your sexual rights and all, but you agree to one kind of right, then that other kind of right is no longer applicable like that. There can be something, you know, those kind of things also. Yeah. Clara, can I, can I say something as well? Sure, sure, Virginia. Okay, yeah, I, these are not connected, but uh, one, I wanted to go back to Victoria's stuff about access to water, because sometimes what it leads me to think is, you know, a lot of our conversation right now has been about ideas and ideologies, but I also think there are all sorts of things that don't necessarily get looked at as issues of human rights, but, but, but they are, they're, they're very, I don't know, they're practical, they're, uh, I don't know, access to land, uh, access to, to labor, whatever it is. The, so that's one thing. The other thing is, I think we need to grapple with the idea of human rights as something that, I don't know, I think, you know, Richard's gone, but maybe somebody here knows. I, I think it largely arose out of, um, I don't know, World War II, the, the, the Nazi atrocities, but it is largely a sort of a Western European and the US Canadian idea. And I think a lot of the rest of the world sees it that way. So, mm -hmm. you know, we can talk about democracy, we can talk about nationalism, we can talk about all sorts of things, but ultimately I think a lot of the idea of human rights that I think all of us on this on the Zoom uh, webinar agree to um, are probably not seen as as appropriate by a lot of people who are not in frankly what I call the North Atlantic but those are the two things the main two main things that I wanted to say mm -hmm. I, I was just thinking Virginia as you were talking and not only I was thinking of all the all the conversation online and everywhere on TVs, et cetera. I don't know if it's happening in your countries, but the all the fuss going on now about the football cup being right. held in Qatar, being held in Qatar and known to be a country where human rights are not respected. Right. And I've heard me and other people, I'm sure, have heard the craziest things coming out of uh the mouths of politicians that should think twice on what they say. Even the Portuguese president, Portugal, fortunately, is supposed to be, like we were discussing, a democratic country and even a more, uh, well, social democrat left, uh, left type of government right now. And the president said something like, well, you know, yes, in Qatar, human rights are not always respected, but let's not talk about that now. Let's now focus on the, on the World Cup. And come on, <laughs> I, I mean, I understand that activists were exactly using this opportunity of having the World Cup in Qatar to bring the issue up to the big mm -hmm. masses of people in the world who love football, which is a huge majority, as you know. So I think this is important. These are important moments to bring public opinion to think about these violations of human rights. I don't know if you agree with me. And the last, the other thing I wanted to say also is this, this question that has been discuss here of tolerance, human rights, and cultural activism is very, very important to me. For me, as an anthropologist and as a citizen, it's one of the most complicated issues because if you think of things like, well, issues actually that I, I hope we will be able to discuss in our next webinar in the beginning of 2023 on Middle Eastern women and, and, and rights. For instance, questions of women and violence towards women and, and questions of, uh, well, not circumcision, but excision of women and genital mutilation. And for instance, if you follow, if you've been following in the past two decades, what's been going on in France, for instance, with the, the you know, not only the use of hijab, but other more complicated issues such as uh, feminine genital circumcision and, and the fact that some people do claim the right to have this because exactly of, well, they do not use the word cultural relativism, but they use the, the idea beyond it, behind it, sorry, which is, yes, we are entitled to our own culture and we are entitled to do this. And then of course the French government says, yes, but you are in a country where this is considered a crime and it's considered a violation of human rights. So for me, this is a very practical example on how such issues are complicated. Of course, they're not complicated when we go to, to 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 issues or to examples like the ones Michelle brought about or the the ones that Magnus brought about where 
you know, totalitarian regimes just uh, totally suffocate minorities, kill them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But things that go on within so-called democratic societies, such as this one that I mentioned. For me, this is one of the big issues in, in the human rights discussion. Where does the right to cultural relativism stop and, 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 and the right of states to impose on rules saying that they are defense of human rights goes in go into play. Oh, I just wanted to say that I think um, we can, um, in a way, we could, <clears throat> on this issue of the Western origins of universal human rights, of course, historically, that's true. But we could also turn it around and say, what we're facing now is 8 billion people, um, a whole series of uh, challenges uh, that we face uh, in this world. Um, lack of water, uh, in my in my fear is that the lack of water in many places is going to engender genocides because there will be arguments from authoritarians saying we need to get rid of these people. They don't have a right to drink any water. <laughs> We need to get rid of them. So these things are interconnected. And I think with the, the challenges uh, of this nature, we if we didn't have the concept of universal human rights, we would have to invent it right now <laughs> because we need a formula for coexisting peacefully and collaborating peacefully across uh, uh, our own artificial boundaries in this world of 8 billion people. And I see universal human rights as, as um, uh, although imperfect and uh, in some, to some extent, colored by its origins, although Eleanor Roosevelt had a very international committee drafting it, actually, including a Chinese guy and an Arab guy. <laughs> but this is the workable framework that we have right now to deal with these issues. And I think that um, on the other side, everywhere what we see is uh, selfishness. The authoritarian and, and regimes are, are all of them uh, nationalistic, intolerant, and selfish. They want to grab uh, yeah. whatever those resources are for themselves mm -hmm. and deny them to others. And for that purpose, they come up with preposterous arguments about how those people have no right, they have not, they are not citizens, they have not been living here. And universal human rights can counter all that. It can say, look, we need to figure out a way here. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I think there are strong arguments for holding on to it, uh, despite everything. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So th thank you very much, Magnus. Well, we've kind of passed one of our one and a half hour of webinar. Normally, our webinars last around one hour thirty minutes, and uh, we've gone beyond that already <laughs> by almost ten minutes. And and um, of course, we could stay here and discuss the human rights issues forever <laughs> because it's endless. Uh, but I think I will ask. Um, I'll make a last call if anyone wants to. Anyone wants to bring up any other common question beyond the ones that have been discussed and are on the chat. Uh, Michelle, Michelle, do you want to speak up? Oh, to so say, if, if anything, things will get complicated, even more complicated. So there's always, I guess, for anthropologists, we'll be busy. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> and Given also has been very active in the chat. I don't know if you want to talk or if you prefer to just Stay in the chat um, because you're you're writing. I wonder if any useful parallels can be seen between individual rights and collective social restrictions to the common good. Respect for universal versus cultural relativism seems a similar tension. I I agree definitely. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. I just... I've, I've spoken with you for ten years and I've never seen your face. Show me your face. <laughs> <laughs> you mean Guven? I know, yes, I know Guven well. He's been active in, in the circles I've been in, but I've never right. seen him. Guven, who are you? <laughs> no face, okay. no face. No face. No face, no face. Well, my bad. connection's not real good, so I'm not okay. sure if I can do that, but let me try. You can, you can show you your face for, for a few seconds. 
Yeah, that's what yeah. I was going to say. <laughs> show, show, show us for a few seconds and then go off, <laughs> go on yeah. again. Um, I, I pushed the button that says show video, but oh, here yeah. we go. Try. No. I know what you look like, but Gordon apparently doesn't. <laughs> uh, by the way, Gilvin, it's a good point that respect may be a, a, a stronger concept than tolerance. You wrote in the chat that tolerance is not enough. Yeah. It means I, just to put up with. Uh, I could argue with that, but I think it's it's a good point that respect has built into it um, an even stronger idea that um, respect is what we need to handle our global problems. Given, where are you? We interrupted. We interrupted. You want? Did you want to say something? We interrupted because Gordon wanted to see your face, but apparently it's not going to happen. Oh, there you are. Oh, there he is. Oh. <laughs> there he is. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for showing yeah. me. You know, okay. Magnus, Turn it off. I, Turn it off. I saw the. I saw the, the badge, the button when I was helping a group of, of Japanese visit Toronto. They wanted to learn how to promote women in the civil service, so they went to. San Francisco, Toronto, and Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I was the interpreter, and it was 20 years ago, but somehow they had these little badges, and I picked one up, and it said something like, not, not tolerance, but respect, and I thought, wow, what a simple message, but a very <laughs> important message. Yeah. You can't just put up with people who you don't like. You have to actually see they have value. Uh, yeah, where are you based at, Govin? Michigan. Uh, I'm in Grand Rapids in West Michigan. Okay, okay, okay. All right, well, this has been really a great webinar, I think, where everybody has really, you know, interacted and it's it was so nice to see Govin's face also <laughs> amongst us. I think too bad Jasmine had to, I had to leave, of forced leaving since her connection was not so good, but it was really, really great to have you all here. I thank you all, the participants and everyone else who contributed through the chat, through the discussion. Uh, I thank you all very much. And of course, I wish you all a very nice season um, and a, a good beginning in 2023, hopefully without or with less violation of human rights and <laughs> wars. Of, of course, I'm being utopic, but well, we're humans. We have to have some hope, I suppose. And, um, and we will definitely see you again in the next webinar, which I'll be organizing with Subhadra, our colleague uh, from India and from IUAS. And as I said, it will be on women and the Middle East. And of course, these issues of human rights directed, obviously, at women will be uh, will be discussed. So we can even consider it a sort of a continuation, the next season of this, of these episodes on human rights. And thank you all very much. You can all watch this video in our um, website, which will be available in, in a few days, not straight away. And it's also being um uh divulgated through facebook so if you want and thank you very very much magnus victoria yasmin uh richard uh shingara and uh and am i missing something and, and yeah i think i've, I've said all the thank names you thank, thank you thank you very much and thank you. see you next time thank you very yeah. much have thank a nice you. new year thank Bye. you you too <laughs> and a nice evening today or a nice day <laughs> <laughs>